should all give yourself a big pat on the back for being the crowd that remembers to set their clock forward. Good job. Good job. Yes, give yourself a hand. Give yourself a hand. I just want to thank the cell phone companies. I don't think I've ever done that in my life, but it's nice to have that automatic update coming from, from them. I had to double check because I wasn't sure that they, they came through, but uh, our cell phone company came through and automatically updated our time. And You might want to make room for those that in about an hour come strolling in. That's kind of, you know, a little bit of joy. You can just make a little room and act like you're being nice. Then when they get in, just give them a little rib, you know, give them a little, hey, how you doing? Welcome to Parkway. Didn't set your clock forward, did you? So, uh, hey, we're glad that you're here. We're, we're glad that you just came to, uh, to connect with Christ this morning, connect with some other believers, and, and we're just going to worship him this morning. We've got some folks that are going to help us with that, so the worship team's going to come. There's also, um, prayer team's going to be available, so there's going to be some folks down here on this uh, main floor that would love to pray with you about any situation that you have going on in your life. Um, you know, I mean... We really strive to, to uh, do our best to be biblical in everything that we do. And so, you, know, you guys can stand back up. <laughs> we need to know who you are. <laughs> we, got some, we got some folks coming up here. And then up in the balcony, the, the Crees, are, Randy and Lee are going to be up in the balcony. So if you're up in the balcony and you need prayer, they're going to be up there. So, you know, if, if any situation... Uh, Holy Spirit inspired James to, to write down some words that if any of you are sick, call the elders of the church for prayer, have them anoint, with, anoint you with oil, and pray the prayer of faith. So that's what these people are here for. For, uh, for those that, that don't need prayer, we're here to sing. We're here to celebrate what, what God has done and who he is, who he is. Sometimes we just get so focused on, okay, what has he done yesterday? Uh, you know, let's celebrate who he is and, and trust him with what he's doing and what he's done and and knowing that he's just going to be there for us. So why don't we all stand, and let's open with prayer this morning. And then we're going to worship him. Lord, we thank you, God, for just, uh, just an amazing place where we can come and worship you. Lord, we thank you for our brothers and sisters that we get to gather with, God, to, to declare who you are, to declare your praises, God. Lord, I pray that today we would do that. Lord, that we wouldn't let anything hinder us from worshiping you, God, from just coming into your presence, Lord, and, and I'm so thankful that you're here, Lord, that we don't have to go and find you. Your word says where two or three are gathered, there you are in the midst of them. So, Lord, you are here right now, and we know that, God, to be true because your word says so, Lord. So, Lord, help us, God, to, to realize that fact and to worship you accordingly, and we thank you for these things. Amen.
Isn't it good that we stand in a power other than ourselves? Isn't it good that we stand in a strength other than ourselves? Isn't it good we stand someplace that's not determined by our mood that day? <laughs> or our faith that day or what we can see that day? Isn't it good that the word does say trust in the Lord with all your heart? Lean not on your understanding. Isn't that a good thing? It's a really good thing. It means that we can come in here exactly how we are. We can stand there and say, Lord, we stand on your strength. You're the rock that we stand on. You're the hope that we have. My hope is not in my own strength and my own wisdom and my own understanding. You are the strength that I stand on. It's a very good thing. I'm going to do something here in the next couple of songs that I very rarely do. You can just play your little thingy there. The kid's going to do it because I'm going to start singing. I know that. <clears throat> when I prepare for songs that we sing together, I long for songs that will be fruitful for us as a congregation, as a family. And often, um, you know, there's songs that just turn something in you. They just, they, they meet you. But sometimes songs that meet me won't be songs I don't uh, that I introduce to the to the family here for months because they're not fruitful yet for a group. I don't know if that makes sense to you. In other words, I don't just take the song of the week for me and make you sing it until today. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so the next two songs basically you're singing because I want to. <laughs> More than that, because I need to. Most of you know that my father died in July, and my mother was actually the one who was very ill. My mother is still with us. Very difficult for me to watch her in misery every day. Six months later, still in misery every day. And I love heaven, so don't you dare to come up and say anything, actually. <laughs> don't, don't tell me anything. Don't tell me your stories or what's going on. Just don't. <laughs> And can you tell I'm tired? Yes. Mm. But the fight in the middle of this for me is to keep my eyes on Jesus. The fight is to do it also in front of you occasionally. So there might be a time when I actually come down off this platform and I turn around, I face the cross. The cross is myself. And I'll keep singing because most of this team here and the people who are supposed to be singing here are sick. So I have to keep singing. But I remember one day when Jamie uh, was preaching and she said, uh, the come to the altar to be altered. And that is what the altar is for me. Some of you wonder why people come to the front. It's because you're saying, Lord, I want to be altered by you. You're not coming because, you know, these guys are not coming because they want you to see them and there's better light up here. You know, it's kind of dark down here, so I'll move right up here where the light is so people can see that I'm worshiping. They're coming to the altar to be altered. If I, when I come down here at the point that I feel that direction, I'm coming to the altar to be altered. And there are those of you who need to come to the altar to be altered. And whether I'm singing over you or I am singing with you, Will you come with me? Will you not stand and go out the same that you walked in because you weren't willing to move? You thought it's too much. Even God can't do anything about this. He's saying, I will and I am. I am. The I is capitalized. The A is capitalized. The M is capitalized. I am. When I look at him and say, God, what are you doing? I hear I am. And for me, the safest place and the place where I am altered the most is in the middle of worship. So I feel a little bit like, let's make a deal. Come on down. <laughs> I don't want it to scare you if I leave the altar and something is different on the platform. They've promised not to have this look on their face like, <clears throat> it's a newer song to us. Some of you might know it. Some of you might not. Don't let that stop you, okay? Hear my heart. This is my heart. If I can just, 
if I can just get there just in a minute. Because <coughs> I <coughs> get post-nasal drip and then I can't sing. <laughs> Evidently, it's not coming out. It's going to, my mother would hate that I just told you that. <coughs> I have decided, I have resolved to wait upon the Lord. My rock and redeemer, shield and
upon you, Lord. Open heaven, God, over this place now. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. 
because we know that in all these things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those that God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that Jesus might be the firstborn among many brothers. Those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he glorified. So what do we say in response to all of that? If God is for us, who can be against us? He didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Why would he not also along with him graciously give us all things? So who can bring a charge against those whom God has chosen? It's God who justifies. So who can condemn? Christ Jesus, who died and more than that was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is interceding for us. So nothing shall separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Father, I pray that you would help us. Father, we come to you like the dad with the little boy that said, I believe, but help my unbelief. And so, God, we come, we've sung it, we've said it, we believe it. We're asking you to do it in our lives. Help faith arise, God. It's not that we don't believe, we're just not sure we believe quite enough in comparison to what it is that we face. I pray, Father, that you would help us to know that no matter what happens, that what you have done in us makes us safe and makes us secure. You have predestined us to be conformed to the image of your Son. And that in spite of present sufferings, what do we say in response to all of this? We say if God is for us, then who or what can be against us? So Father, give us strength, give us courage, give us faith. Help us to look to you when we are so tempted to look at something else and say, wow, that's big. That's scary. Father, help us to look to you because you're bigger and you're scarier. I pray, God, that we would do that, that we would look at you. We would look at you when we are so tempted to look at something else. Help us to be overwhelmed by your love, not overwhelmed by our circumstances. Help us to be overwhelmed by your promises and not overwhelmed by our fears. Let faith arise in our hearts and in our minds, and may we speak and act and decide move as if we really believe what we say we believe. Let faith arise. Let faith arise. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. Say hi to about six people. Can you do that? At least six. I think we, uh, I think we got all six, didn't you? Did you get all six? Give, give yourself another round of applause. Good job, man. You guys are doing great this morning. <laughs> you guys are doing great. Hey, we got a special junior Bible quiz announcement just to bring you up to speed on how they did at their last tournament. So come on up, JBQ team. All right. Thank you, guys. We, we had our last tournament uh, last weekend our last regular season tournament, so next weekend or April 4th, we're going to go to network finals, which is the final competition, and depending on how well we do, we'd go to regionals or even nationals after that. So we're really excited. For our B and C divisions this and our Wee division, this, will, this, April, this April tournament will be their last tournament. So it's our A team that decides to go on. So 
We had a great time. We're done. We're through the whole fact pack, all 576 questions, so they're smarter than they were back in September, right? Yes. Yeah, all right. Some of them are still wondering if they are. <laughs> so uh, now this last tournament's over all the, all the questions, and so now they're working on seals, and they can get different seals at different levels. So if you want to earn a seal, you can do the same thing, and it'll be fun. You can compete against some of these kids, and I know most of you haven't ever done the JBQ, so you would be doing like 10-point only questions with our kindergartners, first and second graders, but that's okay. That's okay because some of our leaders are doing the same thing, so it's, it's all good, right? We got some of our leaders, they just got their discovery seal, so they're excited. Ten-point questions. So uh, our uh, A division, they took third place this last tournament, and they did a great job. Braden took eighth. Yeah, Braden took eighth with one quiz out. Nicole took ninth. Jenna took 11th. Katie, 13th. And Caitlin, 15th. So they were all kind of like right there together in the pack. So they did a great job. <clears throat> our B division is our largest division in the, at, in, the, um, in the state. And our B division took fifth place this last tournament. So they did a great job, too. They had fun. Are you guys going to raise your hands? Raise your hands so they know who you are. So uh, Carson and Brielle, they took 21st, Bryce took 17th, Nathan 12th, Zeke 10th with two quiz outs. So that's how they did. Our C division, they took first place. They did a great job. <laughs> They're humble, too. So uh, it's funny. Some of these kids were shy at the beginning of the year. Um, C division, so uh, Sarah, took, Sarah took fifth place with two quiz outs, and Keaton, he took fourth place with one quiz out. So they did a great job. Our Pee Wee division, they took third place. Where are you at, Keenan and Brella? And Keenan took sixth place, sixth place, and Bella took first place with three quiz outs. So... If you, know, if you know her, she was shy in the beginning of the year, too. And if you get to know her, she's really not shy at all. It's a, so, right, Bella? Okay. See there? I told you. All right. So we have one more regular season tournament, the Network Finals. We're excited about that. And then after that, we'll see if we get to go to regionals and nationals. We appreciate your prayers. If you want to go April 5th in Medford at Bethel Church, we'd love to have you there. You can come check us out. Thanks. Hey, real quick, real quick. We need you guys. JBQ, we need you guys to come over here so everybody on this side can now see you. Come on over here. Come on over here. We need to see your faces too. We were feeling a little left out being on that side. There we go. All right. All right. Thank you, guys. And remember, quiz outs are a good thing. He talked a lot about quiz outs. If you're new or newish, that might sound like, ooh, why are we clapping that they quizzed out? Quiz outs are a good thing. I mean, they got so many right that they said, you guys need to sit down because you're doing too good. So... We need all of the rest of the first through fifth graders to come on right down here. All of the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. Pastor Seth is anxiously awaiting your arrival right back there. If you're a sixth, seventh, and eighth grader someplace else, just meet him down in the foyer. And they're going to head over to the whole center. And first through fifth graders are going to head over to the education wing here in just a second. Just a reminder, if you have kids younger than first grade, there's all kinds of great stuff happening during service right out any of these doors all the way to your left through those double doors and just start walking down the hall and asking questions and we'll help you find a place where nursery or anybody like that needs to go. First through fifth graders. Here they come. Here they come. How are we doing, guys? You guys doing good? How many more weeks of school left? You guys don't have that counted down yet? Okay, 16 more weeks left? I think it's less than that. I think it's less than that. Okay, next week I'm going to ask you. You guys will know. Let's pray for you guys. You guys are going to head out, okay? Lord, thanks for your kids, young and old. God, I just thank you so much for these kids that are standing before, Lord. Lord. Um, grateful for these kids that are part of Junior Bible Quiz, Lord, and, and those that aren't, God, that are going to go over and learn more about who you are. And Lord, 
I just pray that, Lord, what we learned about you this morning, God, would continue. God, that you are bigger than anything in their lives, God. And I thank you, God, that, that they have a chance now to build a foundation on that, Lord. That they just pour out their hearts to you and remember that you are faithful, God, forever, Lord. And I just pray that, that they would uh, know that today. Give the, uh, the leaders and the adults over there strength and wisdom through the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. There you go. Heading out. Waving as you go. Yeah, give them a good wave. It's kind of like being in a parade. Wave. Everybody wave. Everybody wave. Yeah, keep, you're doing a good job. Keep going. Don't stop till you get all the way out. If your arm gets tired, switch arms. There you go. Keep going. Got to like that. All right. Well, we talked about the young kids. Now for the older kids. Life after 50, St. Patrick's Day party. Let's get a good look at our dancing Pastor Ron there. He was moving there a little bit. Is that about how much you, that, that's your comfort zone right there? <laughs> yeah. So that's happening Friday, March 15th, uh, 6 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall. Please be sure to sign up so they make sure they got enough corned beef and cabbage for everyone. So bring a friend. Make sure you sign up that uh, sign-up sheet's right up there out there in the, in the foyer. Newlywed uh, or engaged encounter coming up March 22nd through 23rd. That's right here in town up at Grace Bible Church up at the top of 10th Street. So if you're newly married or planning on getting married, be sure to attend that. There's lots more information there uh, in the bulletin for you, and uh, you can contact those folks. Easter's coming. Easter's coming. March 31st this year, we're going to have a baptism service. So if you have not signed up, we need you to sign up as soon as possible. We're really trying to make sure everybody that is wanting to get baptized, we can uh, get them baptized on that day. Also, just, just to give you a little heads up, that week, during Holy Week, we're going to have some, some prayer opportunity for you, too, during the week. And so uh, just, uh, just be tuned in. Be tuned into that uh, Holy Week. We'll be announcing more about that in the future. And then um, if you are signed up to be baptized or signing up now, we have a class um, that happens March 17th. Uh, that's next Sunday. It's going to be right after service. We have lunch for you in there. And, and just, uh, just want to go over a few things with you, look at some scripture, what does the Bible have to say about water baptism, and then just some of the practical pieces of where you're going to be and, and how it's all, all going to work so that you're not showing up Easter anxious. We want you to be footloose and fancy free and ready to, ready to experience an amazing thing through water baptism. So that's happening um, on March 17th. There you go, Pastor Dennis. Morning. going to ask you in just a minute to, uh, to pray with me for some friends of ours. I, I don't mean friends of just mine. I mean ours. I, I want to tell you a story first, and then I'm going to read some things, and we're going to show you some, some pictures so you can see these people. Er, early on uh, in, the, in the, early, the early years of the last century, there was a missionary who went to the hill country of western China uh, in the area between China and Tibet. They went there to be uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your eye is on the sparrow and your hand it comforts me
wow, lots of stuff up here. <laughs> well, so we shift gears and go to Ephesians now. Can we do that? We are in Ephesians chapter 4. We are to kind of the practic practical section of the book. In the first three chapters, Paul has been telling us this is the amazing thing God has done for us. And, and a lot of the amazing thing that God has done for us has centered around the awareness of the fact that God has included us Gentiles into all the things that he was doing through the Jewish nation. And we have now brought together with them into the glorious kingdom of God. He's been talking about that in the first three chapters. In chapter four, he switches over and he says, I want you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. God has done amazing things for you. You need to respond in appropriate ways. And so he begins to give us practical instruction. And as he goes through these, these practical instructions, he gets more and more specific. And so today we come to a place where he gets very, very specific and begins to identify a particular behavior that he wants to make sure is taken care of in our life. Let's just kind of go back and put the verses in front of us. If you don't have ver the, uh, the, the, a Bible with you, there's a Bible in front of you. You can grab that. In your bulletin are some questions and some uh, page numbers. The page numbers correspond to the Bible in front of you there, and it'll, it'll help you find where we are. So we're on page 812, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. He says, I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding. They are separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. It says, you, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off the old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and in true holiness. So as Paul works his way through this so what section, this so what portion, he talks to us again about the amazing things God has done and how we can and should respond, how we should live. He talks to us about the fact that he's given people to help us. He talks about apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, those that have been tasked by God with helping us figure out how to do the works of service that we are called to. We do those works of service by learning them and practicing them and getting more skilled in what we do, but we also have to learn how to do them together because we don't all do the same thing. And so it's not like tug of war where everybody just grabs the same rope and everybody just pulls the same way. It's much more like a dance. It's something that is intricate. It requires that people know the steps and be in the right place at the right time and know how to interact with the other people that are involved. And so he says we've, we, we've been given some gifts in the form of some people that are going to help us do that. And as he goes through this, he comes to this idea that there's a style of life that we have to put off. He said there is something that is old, it is worn out, it is marred with age. That's literally what he says. It's, it's been defaced by sin. It's, it's this old way of being human. And we have to put that away in place of this new way of being human that's in Christ Jesus. He says this process begins by, by reorienting our very existence, this, this old way of being human began, he says, by the desires of the flesh, what you could feel, what you could touch, what you could taste, and how those senses were connected to emotions in terms of how I felt. And so if I touch this in a particular way, it feels good, so I need to touch it over and over and over again because I want to feel good over and over and over again because I'm not really alive inside, and so I'm trying to find things on the outside that will stimulate feelings and will stimulate senses and will wrap them together into emotions so that I can feel like I was alive today. And he says, what happens is that, that all of that practice is addictive because I felt it and it made me feel good and I had an emotion about being happy and so I like that happiness and I like that feeling and so again, I want to touch it again and I'm going to touch it over again but pretty soon I don't get that feeling anymore by touching that thing so I have to touch something else so that I can have that. He says, that's a way of living. But he said, there's another way of living. There's a way of living where you come alive in the spirit. 
where the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. And we talk about being born again, and we talk about getting saved, we talk about being redeemed. We have all kinds of words to describe it, but what we are actually describing in in terms of what Paul lays out for us in Ephesians is that we're talking about coming to life in the spirit. Because the old way was what I could touch and what I could feel told my mind what to do. Find me something else to touch so that I can feel that way again. It's your job as my mind to find a way for me to satisfy my addiction to good feelings and happy emotions. That's what my mind is designed to do in that old system. Paul says in the new system, you come alive in the Spirit. That that place in you that is created in the image of God, that, that you come alive because the Spirit of God comes to dwell in you. And now the battle is for the mind. Is my mind going to live out the addictions of my flesh and emotions, or is my mind going to live out the sensitivities of the spirits? You know, so in some ways it would be nice if on that day when you belt, you know, knelt before Jesus and said, Jesus, I confess my sins and I repent of them. I turn and move away from them and I confess you as Lord. It would be nice if all of that external stuff that stimulates us kind of just went numb and our spirit could just take over, but it doesn't happen. The container that your spirit is in is still alive and it's used to being in charge. It's used to being in charge. That's that's the the spiritual magic, if you would, of things like fasting. Because we have lived our entire lives saying, I'm hungry. I should eat. And your flesh is going, that's right. Whenever I need something, snap to and take care of me. And suddenly when you come alive in the Spirit, you tell your flesh, get in line. We're not going to eat. We choose to pray instead, and your flesh just screams at you. It just turns up the volume. Didn't you hear me? I'm hungry. And your spirit says we're choosing to pray. I said I'm hungry. We're choosing to pray instead. What do I have to do to get your attention? I am hungry. And the battle's on. And in your mind, you have to decide. Do we go with the flesh or do we go with the spirit? Now that's kind of a simple illustration, but Paul is going to tell us there is an old way of being human and it's marred, it's worn out, it's defaced by sin. Get rid of it, put it off, put it to death, he says, and instead take up this new way where the spirit makes the call. The mind facilitates that call and the flesh gets in line behind that he said these people have given themselves over and they are have no life inside so they have given themselves over to sensuality and a continual lust for more because all sin is addictive all sin is addictive and destructive he says you you've come to to know a new way you've become truly human there is this other way to turn it around we are human beings now made alive by the spirit Here's something I want you to do in your bulletin. It's not written there. There's no notes. There's nothing on the screen. You're just going to have to be creative and do this. I want you to put a large capital S. Then I want you to put a small case S behind it, next to it. P-I-R-I-T, spirit. Capital S, little s, spirit. The reason I want you to see that is that when Paul talks about spirit, and when you read through the New Testament and are reading through what Paul says about spirit, he is quite often talking about, at times, capital S, the Holy Spirit of God. Sometimes he's talking about small case S, the spirit that is in you, that is part of what it means to be created in the image of God, that part of you that has come alive because of the big S spirit that's made the little S spirit come alive. And sometimes he's talking about both of them functioning together. So here's your trick, your assignment, your difficulty. As you're reading the New Testament this week, try to figure out which S should be in that word spirit as you read 
your verses this week. So as you're doing your devotions and you're reading through Galatians or Ephesians or Philippians or you're in one of those books, you know, if you're in the Old Testament, it doesn't work for you, but if you're currently doing your devotions, you're reading through the, through the New Testament and you come to the word spirit, try to figure out which spirit it is. Now, I'm going to tell you, and some, sometimes there's a right and wrong answer. Sometimes it's very clear when he talks about the spirit of God, you know, but there are other times when he uses that and you're going, well, that, that sounds like something the Holy Spirit would do. But that sounds like that would be part of my life in the Spirit. So is it capital S, small s, or is it both? But if you can begin to grasp that concept, for Paul, what it means to be a Christian is to be a person in whom the capital S Holy Spirit has come to dwell. And by that process, the small s, the spirit of humanity that is in you, that was dead until you were born again of the spirit, has come to life. And sometimes he means when the big s and the little s get their act together and they live out life according to the will of God instead of the will of the flesh. But if you can begin to see that, that's what Paul's trying to say here. He's talking about that kind of life. So once he gives us that kind of life, he says that we get set free from this idea of living according to the addictions of our flesh and the addictions of our emotions, and it returns to this place where we have greater increased alertness, or what Paul says is sensitivity instead of sensuality. So if we have come to this capital S, small s, life of the Spirit, what are we supposed to do? His first directive for us is in verse 25. He says, therefore... Right? And like the old theologian said, anytime you see therefore, you need to go back a few verses and find out what it's there for. Okay? So it's just a pretty simple deal. If you get to a place in the Bible and it says therefore, and you don't remember what came before that, back up until you get it. All right? So the therefore here is connecting to because this has happened. You've been made alive in the Spirit. You are no longer given to the addictions of sensuality, but you've been made alive and have become sensitive to the things of the Spirit. You have put off the old life and you are putting on the new life. Therefore, now he's going to give us some specifics. Each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Now, the, the wording here is actually, therefore having once for all put off the lie having put off the lie. So in, the, in, in this setting aside of the old way of being human for this new way of being human, part of what is involved in this is very specifically putting away the lie. Now I need you to know that includes the lies that we believe, not just the lives that we tell. Okay? Because this, this, is, this, is, this is a Weberism. I believe that most of the lies that we tell are directly connected to a lie that we believe. That most of the lies that we tell are directly connected to a lie that we believe. Which is why I believe Paul chose the language to say, therefore, once and for all, put off the lie. The application of that is, and then don't lie to each other. I think you have to put off the lie so that you won't lie. Some of you are still working on that. <laughs> I, I would tell you that because I think that the, the, the very source of failure for us as a human race is the lie that we believed. When Adam and Eve were in the garden, where the thing went wrong was when they chose to believe a lie. God has said, he's not telling you the truth. This is what will, they believed a lie. Because they believed a lie, they acted poorly. I believe that the telling of lies comes from the believing of lies. And so we as a race continue to believe lies. And we continue to behave wrongly because we believe those lies. And in the process, some of us have just developed the habit of lying. It's an expression of who we are, and it's a means to get what we want. We've become liars, and it's a tool that we use to get what we want. I want you to stop and think about all the great stories you've ever heard. I mean, you go all the way back to the Greek plays. You can put it into the Shakespearean plays. 
You know, you can put them to music, and now you got Romeo and Juliet called West Side Story. I mean, you just, just stop and think of all of, the, all of the plays and all of the great stories, and think of the soap operas from those really nasty ones that you're not supposed to watch that come on during the middle of the day, or those really upscale ones where everybody dresses real nice and has an accent called Downton Abbey. Think about those. What keeps those stories going? Somebody says a lie, or somebody believes a lie. Then all kinds of drama gets thrown together because people are confused and misinformed, and this person thinks one thing's going to happen, this person thinks something else, and that person thinks that person doesn't like me, and this other person thinks that somebody else is going to save them, and then that person doesn't show up, and, and all this stuff happens. And then pretty soon, at some critical point, just before the commercial break, the truth comes out. And then it all resolves with a little bit of a hook so that you come back for episode three next week. Right? I mean, isn't that the way it all works? I mean, all those stories are based on a lie. You have to have a lie that creates all the tension so that you can have the resolution and it sort of ends. And if it's a true soap opera, it can only sort of end because they got to get you to come back to the notch the next show. Why do we identify with all of those stories? Why do we watch all of those things? Because it reminds us of life. It happens all the time. It happens in our families. The difference is in our families, the episodes are holidays. <laughs> you know, the commercial breaks are all those months in between, you know? But that Thanksgiving Christmas season can get really tough because you can't get away from them. And all the lies that have been told, and everybody falls back into old roles, you know, and, and you know, people on Social Security are acting like they're 12. And all the family dysfunction comes back, and all the lies we've told, and all the lies we believed create all of this tension. And finally, somebody can't stand it anymore, and there's this big blow up, and maybe it resolves, and maybe it doesn't, or maybe somebody just walks out the door, and everybody goes, well, it's easier to eat without them. You know, I mean, but somehow something happens and there's a resolution to this thing. The drama of what it means to be human apart from God, as exemplified by all of our stories, is that we lie. And then we get caught and then we resolve and then we lie again. It's who we are. Paul says, therefore, once and for all, put off the lie. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. How many of you in the Bibles that where you were reading, if you read along, saw that it was capitalized? Did you notice that? How many of you saw that in the Bibles? It was it was capitalized. Four of you. That's good. Did none of the rest of you read it, or was it not capitalized? I, you, you weren't reading along? You were just, just trusting me that I, I wasn't making it up? <laughs> uh, the, the, the reason that it's capitalized is because the, 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 the interpreters believe that it's a quote. In this case, they believe that it's a quote from Zechariah chapter 8, verse 16. Zechariah is a prophet in Israel at the time when the Israelites are coming back from captivity. And here's what the prophet is saying. He's saying, remember that the reason we ended up in captivity was because we sinned, and God warned us that if we sinned, it would go badly. And amazing, wasn't it? God told us the truth. We sinned, and it went badly. <laughs> he says, but God is now promising that you're not just physically returning, but that you can return to a better life. And so the prophet is saying... God has made promises that he is going to restore you. If you're going to live in those promises, then there are certain things you should do. And one of the things that the prophet says is that you should no longer lie. And so Paul reaches back and grabs that and says, just like the Israelites went from living in captivity to being restored to the land of promise, you have gone from being dead in your sins to alive in Christ. You have moved into a life of promise. Those of us that have moved into a life of promise should no longer lie. We should put away the lie. 
It's interesting to me the motivation that Paul says that we should have for this. I mean, you, you, you thought he might have said, well, okay, you shouldn't lie because lying's bad. Or you shouldn't lie because Satan's a liar and the father of all lies, so you shouldn't do that. He says the reason that we shouldn't lie is because we are members of one another. We are members of one another. Uh, in the NIV that we read, it says, you know, members of one body, and it's just kind of trying to keep the imagery there the same. But, but Paul uses stronger words. He says, we are members of one body. We are, we, are, we are more than that. We actually belong to each other. We belong to each other. And so giving up the lie means that I no longer believe the lies about God. I no longer believe the lies about myself. I no longer believe the lies about my relationship with God. And I no longer believe the lies about you and the things that justify my lying to you. Paul says, it's, it, give up the lie. Put the lie away. Do that because we belong to each other. And it's this idea of belonging that goes to the source of who I am and my new identity that if I truly belong, I am secure enough that I don't have to lie. I don't have to lie. Because I am a member of the body of Christ with you. I'm safe with you. And you're safe with me. Paul says, put away the lie because you belong together. Not just because lying's bad or because it has bad effects or because Satan is a liar. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons he could have used. He's just saying, because you belong together. Because you're in. He says, be a person who's all in with belonging to people who are all in. And in the safety of that, you can give up the lie and you don't have to lie anymore. In, in your care groups this week, when you gather together and, and you get a chance to talk about you know, what I was saying and, and find out whether or not it was any good or if you had a better way of saying it, you get a chance to talk in, the, in your groups about what is it that causes us to lie? I mean, and, and don't, don't, we, don't we tend to lie because we want to impress people? So here's what really happened, but I can kind of make it look better. You know, I can just kind of embellish it. You know, the fish was this big. <laughs> you know, it was this big, you know. It's just, you know, the stories always get better. Have you ever noticed that? That all of the stories you tell about yourself, the more you tell them, the better you look. Till pretty soon you were virtually superhuman in that event. I mean, it just grows. What are we doing? We're telling a lie to impress. But why do we need to impress? Because I'm not sure I fit in. I'm not sure I belong. I'm not sure that I'm safe. And so if I make myself valuable in the eyes of others, if I make myself significant in the eyes of others, if I make myself important in the eyes of others, I pro I'm more secure in the group. They're less likely to jettison me because I'm so important. I'm so significant to this thing. I want to impress. We lie to impress. We lie to fit in. That was a big phrase at our house with the boys. Don't lie to have friends. Don't lie to have friends. If you've got to lie to have friends, they're not worth having as a friend. Don't lie to have friends. But we do that a lot. We lie to avoid conflict. You see, I'm not really sure that I fit in. I'm not sure that we're really members one of another. I'm not really sure that you're not going to jettison me and the relationship with me if things go badly. So the only way I can make sure that I'm safe and that I'm secure is to never bring up anything that causes a conflict. And so if you ask me a question and I know that the answer to that question is going to upset you, I'd rather lie than have the conflict. In your care groups, you're going to get a chance to investigate that and go, why do we lie? And I'll give you my Weberism. I believe that the reason that we lie is because we believe a lie. That somehow I'm not safe with God and somehow I'm not safe with you. And because I'm not safe with God and because I'm not safe with you, I have to bend things. I have to stretch things. I have to impress you. I have to avoid conflict with you. Because we're not big boys and girls that can handle conflict. So we have to act like little boys and girls and we have to lie. Paul says, because of all of these things God has done for you, live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Therefore, 
be done with the lie. And as a result, speak the truth to each other. Did you see that? Be done with the lie, and as a result, speak the truth to each other. If, you know, if you're not done with the lie, you're going to eventually lie to me. But if you get done with the lie, then you'll probably tell me the truth. Paul says that's how we should live. In Colossians, he says the same thing. He says, don't lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices. You've put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of the Creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. In other words, everybody has to tell the truth. You can't just say, well, you know, I'm Italian. <laughs> you know, I'm Irish. You know, you know. <laughs> You, 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 can't, you can't just claim some, you know, some special group and say, well, you know, it's just what we do. <laughs> you, know, you say, no, 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 don't lie. And by the way, it applies to everybody. I don't care what group you think you're in. You can't get away, you know, just don't, don't do that. You know, not telling the truth is pretty universal, but telling the truth needs to become universal to all of us who are in Christ. And the book of Revelation is pretty clear. The book of Revelation is pretty clear that liars and those who love the lie are specifically excluded from the kingdom of God. When he says, you know, when it gets to the end and we decide who's going which direction, he said the liars are going this way. The non-liars are going that way. He makes it pretty clear. Makes it pretty clear. So this idea of truth, knowing truth, living in the truth, speaking the truth, these are all things that are significant to what it means to be in the kingdom of God, what it means to be living as truly human, having put off the old self and put on the new. Being in the light means having nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. And the idea of lying is very significant to this idea of what it means to be living according to darkness instead of light. So that gets us to our blue cards. For those of you that aren't normally with us, what everybody does every week at the end of service is they take out their blue card, they put their name on it, and they all stick it in the offering And when the offering is collected in just a few moments. So if you don't fill one of these out, you would be the weird one. So in an attempt to fit in in the midst of your insecurities, you would fill out a blue card so as to feel better about yourself and more well accepted. You see how natural it comes? Just that whole manipulation thing? You just see how it works? It's just a part of us, isn't it? We got to do better. We got to do better. So not everybody does it every week. Just the good people. Uh, so you put... <laughs> it's just too easy. It's just too easy. But we put our name on there... And there's a chance for you to put, put prayer requests, and, and, and I want you to know we do pray about those. There are several groups of people, uh, starting, first of all, on Tuesday morning with our staff when we, we pray about the cards that have come in. But if, if you have prayer requests, and if you have things that you've asked us to pray about and God's answered that, it's a, it's a way for you to communicate that. But over here on this front section, we're, we're looking at what, what is my next step. I was here today. I experienced something. What is my next step? I, I want to drop down to the, to the very bottom place where it says other, and you have a chance to, to put something in there. Some significant things happened during worship. There was, a, there was this incredible call to faith. Paul repeatedly says, I think it's four times in the New Testament, that the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith, not by sight, but by faith. By faith in what? In the one who loved me and gave himself up for me. Faith in him. And so during worship, that might be the most important thing that happened. I mean, you might have said, you know, well, the sermon was okay. But what, the, the big thing that happened for me was that call to faith, that call to believe in the one who loved me and gave himself up for me. Because right now, what I want to believe are my circumstances. I want to believe that, th that I'm in trouble. I want to believe that it's not going to work out. I want to believe the fact that I feel the pain. I want to believe in all of that stuff instead of believing in the one who loved me and gave himself up for me. So some of you need to come down here and mark other and just put faith right there and say faith is, that call to faith was for me. If that's your step this week, you need to remind yourself of that when something other than faith wants to take over your thoughts and emotions. 
The thing that's always there at the top, and I would just call you again there, there, as we prepare for Easter, what an incredible time to declare the fact that you've decided to become a Christian. <laughs> Some of you aren't even sure exactly what that means, but it looks better than the alternatives, and so you're starting. If, if you are at that place of starting a walk of faith with Christ, then you mark that and we'll follow up and you'll get a call and we'll arrange for you to be a part of that baptism. Because that's what we're talking about, right? Here's an old way of being human. Here's a new way of being human. I choose to go that way. And it happens through repentance and confession and baptism. And so there I go. So you can mark that. In specific to what we've been talking about, I need to stop believing the lies that justify my bad behavior. I have, to, I have to do that. Because the lie is, they won't listen to me unless I yell at them, so I have to get angry. They won't like me unless I lie about who I am, because they won't like me. The only way I can be happy is to be immoral. The only way I can be happy is to spend lots of money that I don't have, so I can have things, so I can touch them, and polish them, and ensure them and parade them around and brag about my stuff, and then I'll feel good about myself. Whatever the lie is, because see, it leads to bad behavior. I have to stop believing that. I have to stop believing that. Because if you try to change your bad behavior, but you don't give up the lie, the lie will overwhelm your commitment to good behavior. You've got to give up the lie, then you can change the behavior. And then I need to speak the truth in all situations, which is harder than it sounds. <laughs> it is harder than it sounds. Now, it doesn't say that you have to say everything that is true. Okay? It says I need to speak the truth in all situations, but it doesn't mean that you have to say everything that's true. There are some times you just need to shut up and go home. <laughs> okay? Okay? So there's nothing on here that says, I'm just going to go around telling the truth to everybody all the time, whether they want to hear it or not. I mean, that's not what we're saying. But we are saying, if you do bother to say anything, make sure that what you say is true. Sometimes discretion is the better part of value. You just, mm -hmm. <laughs> I have no opinion on that. Thank you very much. <laughs> I mean, you just need to, mm -hmm, okay. So this is, this is not a license <laughs> to go beat people up verbally. <laughs> as long as it's the truth. <laughs> Just remember, we did talk a couple weeks ago about speaking the truth in love. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, connect the dots. Okay, so you filled out your blue card? Did you write a really, really big check? That'd be fun. I, I, just, I just thought I'd ask, but, you know, oh, so big or small, we're going to collect the offering, we're going to collect our blue cards, we're going to bring them up here, we're going to put them on this table, and we're going to dedicate our lives to God, and we're going to say, here I go. Here I go. So God bless you as you give. Thank you for that. I can't repay you. God does that, but I can say thank you. So I will say thank you for being faithful. Thank you for your gifts. It's what turns the lights on and keeps the heat going. All of that. So thank you for your faithfulness in that regard. I would ask you now to be thinking and praying and prepping together for our, our time of, of celebration at Holy Week. On Palm Sunday, we're going to do uh, communion together and build the service around the sacrifice of Christ and what it means for us to enter into that life. Because Jesus said that whoever would be his disciple would take up their cross and follow him. So he took up his cross and followed his father in obedience. We take up our cross and follow him. And we're going to talk about that and we're going to celebrate communion together. On Easter, we're going to celebrate water baptism and new life and and so that's going to be a great celebration that's going to happen. And Pastor Jason indicated to you that there's going to be some special prayer opportunities that are going to be happening. Um, and, and one of those is that we're in the process of doing something we've never done before. Some of us have experienced it, but we've never really done it before. Um, but we, we think we're going, to, we're going to do it well. And we're going to give you an opportunity to come and pray not just with words, but to pray with tactile to touch and experience some things in a, in, a, in a prayer walk or a prayer labyrinth where you would start at one end and you would walk through a series of things. And it, so it's, it's ways for you to touch and feel and hear your prayers. And so we're, we're going to give you an opportunity to do that. I, I don't know what all will happen, but I, 
uh, in that. I'm not, I'm not personally putting it together, but I have some very vivid memories of some times when I've done that, um, and some things have stuck out, out to me. I'll, I'll never forget the time when I, I was to take a little stone, and I, it, was, it was to represent my sin in my old life, and I was to drop it into this huge vase, uh, kind of a jar thing, stood about yay tall, and and I could watch that as it disappeared into the darkness and went away. And I've never forgotten that. That's what, that, that's what happens in my old life. If any man is in Christ, they're a new creation. Old things are gone and all things become new. And I just, I watched that go away and it's just like, yeah. It's just stuck with me for years. And so we're going to give you a chance during Holy Week to have an opportunity to pray that way, to have an experience of prayer. That is, that is tactile as well as just what we think of, and that is prayer is words. We want you to be able to touch and see prayer, not just say prayer uh, during that week. So that's going to be part of our Holy Week celebration. And so, you know, for some of you, you go, well, that's kind of weird, you know. Well, decide it's weird after you do it, not before, you know. It's just, it's just, just a thought. Wow, that didn't take very long. Do we need to do it over? <laughs> Bring, bring, bring our blue cards up here, our offerings up here, would you? Thank you for doing that. Thanks. Wow, Jack, you got a lot of them. <laughs> Lorraine, you only have one. <laughs> Jack had four. I was just thinking, I, I, you know, what we do here is kind of symbolic, and I was thinking symbolically what I need to do is to crawl up there on that table with those and say, God, help me tell the truth. <laughs> so God hears our lives, and symbolically our lives are on this table, this place where we set communion the elements of your body broken for us. And we're saying, God, I thank you for the new life that you give me. Now help me live a life worthy of the life that I have now received. Help me put off the old ways. And God, we're just going to tell you that this thing about the lie is tough for us because there's so many lies we believe. We look ahead and we go, ooh, that's going to happen or that's going to be bad or I, I, know what, I know what those people are thinking or... There are so many lies we believe, and then we act as if they were true, and then it just gets worse. Father, may we therefore, having once and for all put off the lie, speak the truth to each other. Father, for every lie that the enemy whispers in our, in, into our heads and into our hearts that says you're not safe and you have to impress people and you have to stretch the truth to make them like you and you, you can't tell them what you're really struggling with because then they would get rid of you and all the stuff, all the stuff. Father, help us be able to put away the lie. Help us to be able to speak the truth. Help us to be people of the light and not people of the dark. Thank you, God, for all that you do to change us from being sort of human to being truly human, alive in the Spirit, people of honesty, people of the truth. Thank you for helping us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. See you next week.
幸福。